Hello everyone, it is That Wings Guy, and we are here for yet another episode. This is like two weeks in a row, and that's like an amazing feat here lately. Um, we're recording this on March the 29th, and we have a newcomer with us tonight. This is uh, Shane Kerwin's first time being on the show. So Shane, introduce yourself. Hey, uh, honored and humbled. I'm Shane Kerwin, uh, owner-founder of uh, Personal Survival Solutions. And, uh, you know, Brian and I got together to do this collaborative class uh, that we think could really benefit some people. And I don't know, Lee, do you want the whole background or just just a hello? Uh, sure, go ahead and give it now. Okay, so um, I retired from the military in 2018. I did uh, 24 years, 16 of them in special operations uh, up at 5th Special Forces Group at Fort Campbell. Uh, when I came in in the early 90s, uh, I went and went into the infantry, uh, but I went right into the reconnaissance where I was in a scout platoon in the DMZ in Korea, and then uh, went to airborne school in the 82nd where I continued on with uh, reconnaissance and scout operations, and then added uh, some sniper operations too. Uh, in 99, I went to selection and assessment for special forces and was selected and went through the qualification course to uh, attempt to be a special forces medical sergeant. So that took about two and a half years of my life. I uh, got up to 5th Special Forces Group in uh, September of 02, uh, went to their in-house sniper course, and then uh, went down to Fort Bragg or Fort Liberty now and challenged their level one course. Uh, came back from that. Uh, we took some Christmas leave and then got geared up to go to Kuwait to invade Iraq. So I've got uh, three all expense paid trips to Iraq for uh, the invasion. OIF-1, OIF-2, OIF-3. Um, I served in the roles in 5th Special Forces Group as a junior medic, a senior medic, a company medic. And then uh, I took some time and I went down to that in-house sniper course and I was a junior instructor, senior instructor, and then the non-commissioned officer in charge of that course. And then the Army and in its infinite wisdom decided to promote me out of that. And uh, so I took company operations and helped stand up uh, in the kingdom of Jordan, uh, Syria, train and equip. And then I got to uh, pick my own team where I went back uh, to Jordan again and then did a few other trips. Uh, I've got uh, 11 trips overseas. I uh, have them in the global war on terror. In about 07, uh, I started concurrently uh, training on the armed citizen side. Uh, so I was doing that with a company. And then uh, towards when I was getting towards my retirement, in 18 with some encouragements for some other trainers. Uh, I started PSS and uh, when I retired right out the gate, we had uh, the company going. Uh, we picked up the Barrett Firearms contract to do their long range stuff. I was doing some things with uh, a crisis resolution uh, company, uh, which I still do to this day. And then um, I started working at Royal Range USA as an instructor there part time. I uh, ended up being the lead instructor and then the uh, training manager. And a couple of years ago, uh, you know, it was getting to be too much. So we kind of walked away from a lot of that stuff. And so now we just do uh, PSS exclusively. And uh, and I do a little bit of contract work with that crisis resolution risk mitigation company. So uh, that's kind of me in a nutshell. There you go. There you go. Uh, also joining us tonight, Brian Hill. Hey, everybody. Would you like a brief introduction also? Sure. This is your <laughs> this is your third time on the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Brian Hill with Complete Combatant. I've been a lifelong martial artist, and uh, I did a brief stint with the Fulton County Sheriff's Office, and I have been a sponsored shooter and trainer with HK and Filster, and we just partner with Holosun. I travel the country uh, teaching primarily pistol classes, occasional rifle classes, and uh I have been a lifelong coach. I've got about 125,000 hours of teaching experience now, over four decades of teaching martial arts. Uh, and I've been to Olympic Training Center. I've been to all the high-level coaching programs. And I teach a program called Deliver Coaching, which teaches people how to coach, not particularly a curriculum-based instruction, but how to coach people better. Inner Game of Shooting, which teaches people how to deal with themselves since they're the constant in their fight. And then, of course, optics pistol classes and optics principles, how perception and vision works. All right. Cool. And you two have combined for a class that we're going to be talking about 
for the rest of this episode. And one of your students that graduated this class and frequent guest on the show, <laughs> Shannon Pable. I'll keep mine really brief. I'm a training junkie. And there you go. <laughs> and you have the best garden in all of Gundam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I garden and shoot guns. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good combo. Yeah. yeah. And both extraordinarily well. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's good to have other things because I like I got asked, what do you do when you're not doing this? And like this. <laughs> <laughs> you should have something else to fall out, fall back on. Um now, you guys came up with a course, and it's called the Singleton Operator Course. Would you explain the concept behind that? Go ahead, Shane. So, you know, Brian and I got talking. Uh, we were down there taking one of his classes, and, and you know, we've done several things together. And uh, we started talking about a collaborative class and, and kind of pooling some ideas. And actually, it was Brian that came up with the uh, Irregular Warfare piece and then as we were going through and working on the uh, description, uh, I added the singleton operator and it was, you know, kind of for us to, you know, get a new look at something unique, uh, the ability to to work a rifle and a pistol, uh, you know, individually was to solve a problem set. And just with some of the things that are going on, you know, in, in society and the world right now and things that we've seen in the past, uh, you know, that's a skill set that. Uh, we think, you know, people need to know how how to, you know, employ those to protect themselves, protect people they care about. And that was kind of the genesis for for this class. All right. Use a term there that I think we need to define, and that is irregular warfare. Brian, I'll let you take that one. You came up with that part. I liked it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, especially uh, as we watch the news and we look at a certain level of lawlessness in America sometimes and then. Uh, I was watching Christian Craighead storm the, the hotel in Nairobi, and it occurred to me that uh, as as armed citizens, we occupy maybe three three courses. One is that we what we carry on a daily basis, our EDC, you know, we carry a pistol, very slick, uh, very little equipment, but just enough to manage the situation. And then some of us have either a, a, a truck gun or a home defense rifle. And then maybe we have a battle belt to go with it. And then some people actually get to the full battle rattle and they, they have a complete kit. And the idea was if you were by yourself, how much advantage could you get if you had this gear, number one, worked out so it works very well and it's integrated? Because oftentimes in classes, we do these separately. Uh, number two, how much complexity and novelty could we offer the students so that they could really uh, have a different perspective over what it takes to be a, a good warrior, uh, whatever tools are present? And then the last one is for people to understand the great capacity uh, between the pistol and the rifle and how some work in better situations. Uh, sometimes the pistol's a better choice. Sometimes the rifle's a better choice because mostly in pistol and rifle classes, you know, the pistol is always because the rifle went down uh, and then we're just going to use it. So we were thinking about how would a person uh, deal with some of the situations that we see from, you know, a, an active shooter in a church to a school uh, to just navigating a parking lot. And how could we help them with this mindset of uh, being a gorilla, uh, being in the, in the midst of it and using whatever's to your advantage, uh, you know, and I spent a lot of my life teaching martial arts that were unarmed. So this is a great step up. And I think between the two of us with his skill set and my skill set, it was a nice combination of uh, lots of real world experience and using uh, the rifle and understanding how it does and a lot of performance methodology that we could put on top of it so people can understand themselves and how they perform it under pressure. Okay, two things from that I want to touch on. And sure. uh, I'm Eric Lund, who is, has been one of my longer serving mentors in this whole thing, is fond of saying that the pistol is not a secondary you know, platform to the rifle. It is a complementary platform to the rifle. And that sounded just kind of like what, what you just described. And the other is, is he says that, you know, people tend to drive the carbine like they drive the pistol. And it's kind of the difference between driving, you know, down an interstate 
alone at night and you know that there's no cops out there that are going to be running radar and that there's no livestock out on the thing. Okay, you're still going to drive it the way you would drive your Honda Civic. Or are you going to drive it the way you would drive a Corvette if you have one? And that's kind of the difference between a pistol and a rifle. That's what I said. Yeah, he pointed it out, so I started watching for it in classes. You'll see people they'll run the rifle in a very similar context than the way they run the pistol, when there's so much more capability. Am I on track with what you guys are talking about here? Yeah, Lee, but, I, I think so. And you know, as we were going through this, you know, we kind of wanted to, uh, you know, marry up the two systems and get people to understand their their pros and cons also understand uh, their limitations with it because, you know, everybody has those, but we got to be honest with ourselves and, and understand, Hey, you know, this is the appropriate tool to fix that problem. Um, this might not be because maybe I'm outside my capabilities with it. And, you know, with the, with the rifle, you know, in particular, I think um, there is a lot of times where you see people run them, you know, similarly to their pistols and, there is some commonality between them, you know, with curriculums and that, but there's, there's a lot more that you can do with the rifle. It's just, you know, getting out there and getting the training and put the work in, which, you know, is one thing when, you know, Brian and I were talking about this, that not that there isn't people out there that do it, but it just seemed to be kind of lacking. And so, you know, bringing this all together and, and showing the capabilities of, of both systems and what you can do with them and picking the appropriate thing uh, to fix that, that problem, uh, you know, was a big, big part of us, uh, you know, putting together this course. Ron, you have anything you want to add to that? You know, I, I know you can relate to this too, especially uh, there's a lot of times where a pistol simply easier, especially in the house, opening doors, managing people, moving people out of the way. And, uh, you know, what we did interesting in this class is we took the rifle all the way out to 300 yards so they could they could get the distance. It wasn't just using the rifle and the pistol in the same space and they could get a real feel for it. You know how the difference between the mechanical offset with the rifle and what's interesting now is uh, rifles and pistols tend to have dots on them. So they have to really understand the difference in the recoil methodology and when sometimes it's simply easier to work one over the other and uh, how how they they complement each other. I think that's a great word is that they do complement each other and they, they really complete it. And, you know, if you were by yourself, you would be uh, very remiss not to have both skills being well met if you had both both weapons with you. Yeah, two, two things from that is it's interesting that you pushed it out to, to 300. Go to rifle classes and we shoot at 15 yards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, and, and I understand that there is space limitations and stuff on a lot of ranges. I love asking this question when I'm teaching cops. You know, what distance is your patrol rifle zeroed at? And they'll say, oh, 50 yards. Why is it zeroed at 50 yards? And they start trying to give me all these things. Well, you've got, you know, if it at 50, it crosses back at 200 and all this kind of stuff. And I said, no, the correct answer is 50 yards was the longest range you had available. <laughs> Forget all that other nonsense. <laughs> it only applies if you're using certain ammo that matches up with those charts. Because what works with your, you know, my 16 inch Colt 6920, it's going to be the same with that guy's 12 inch over there so forget all this at 50 it's back on at 200 uh, or 250 or whatever it is the claims are it's zeroed at the max distance in which you zeroed it right. um then the other thing is mechanical offset as i find teaching people that that is the hardest concept to get them to actually internalize and accept because they understand it when they're in their conscious brain and you're sitting there telling them, hey, remember your offset, all that kind of stuff. And then as soon as you put them under pressure, they go right back to shooting where the dot is or where the sights are. And we have those mechanical offset problems pop up. And that may even be exacerbated, exacerbated somewhat more now that pistol-mounted optics have become so common. Because it used to be you had, okay, your aim point on top of your rifle, well, my, this sight picture looks this way, but my pistol sight picture looks this other way, and you can kind of process that. Now they look the same. And I, I've seen some of that kind of issue even, even more so. Now, obviously, if someone that lives with the carbine all the time, they don't have that. Uh, Shane, has that been your experience? Yeah, but, you know, like like you said, Lee, I think 
uh, you know, mechanical offset is one of the hardest things that I've found with students, even back, you know, my former job, you know, that we'd go out as the team guys and we do, you know, ready positions, ready ups. And, you know, you'd have to remind them, hey, you know, don't forget about your mechanical offset. You're shooting, you know, a two or three inch dot. And it's one thing in in the class what we talked about was, you know, there's two different ways that we can kind of skin this cat. And, you know, people are going to wrap their brains around it depending on, you know, what their personality is and just how how their brain, you know, takes that information in. But one is to, you know, put the work in and make it so it's intuitive that when you get it within, you know, a certain range that, you know, you have to apply, you know, so much of a holdover to get the round to go where it needs to. Or another way that I found that really works for people, and this this works also if, uh, say, the target or, you know, the person that you're shooting the threat is at an odd angle and your mechanical offset is up in space, is taking your sighting system, putting it where you want the bullet to go, and then applying that holdover. And uh, for whatever reason, the brain can calculate it better, uh, that mechanical holdover, and they seem to get better placed shots. Ron, any thoughts? Yeah, it was interesting with the pistol too, going from the rifle to the pistol, because there's, you know, the dot stays in the window the whole time you're shooting the rifle. Uh, in fact, in some of the rifles, uh, depending on the comp they have on it, it tends to have negative recoil. And then when you change the pistol, you could see them really struggle with how much everything was moving in comparison to it and the recoil process. So you had this the offset on the rifle, but you had the recoil problem on the pistol. It was very interesting to watch the brains try to go back and forth between the two. And as you said, you know, they're, they're it's they're very different by nature but we're seeing the same perception of it. Uh, so it was interesting to watch. And I found a big diversity between uh, the re- some of the really competent rifle shooters really struggled with the pistol occasionally. And some of the really good pistol shooters, they couldn't remember their mechanical offset because they weren't used to it with their, with their pistol. It's really interesting to watch. Yeah. I was teaching a couple of years ago for the sheriff's office that I was with. And I was really stressing this mechanical offset issue in the same way that I stretch it to stress it when I'm teaching an open enrollment class. And then the feedback that I got later on was not that people understood the importance of the issue. It was like, if these things are so horrible, why does, why did Williams buy them for us? That was not the message that I was trying to send, <laughs> but that was the message that came across. And yes, that's why I'm always curious whenever I talk to other people that teach rifle classes, particularly if they walk in both worlds, like, what are you seeing when you try to teach mechanical offset? And how big of a problem do you see it actually being in the real world? Well, one of the things, too, Lee, that you know, we talked about in class that I've seen is, you know, people misunderstand the difference between whatever zero that you're going to run and that mechanical offset. It's, it's not a zero issue. You know, it's an actual physical Mm -hmm. difference between the sighting system and the muzzle of the rifle. And, you know, I've had some pretty experienced people, uh, you know, give advice and say, Hey, um, I, I zero my rifle at whatever 10 yards. So I don't have to take into account that offset. And it's like, no, it doesn't work like that. You know, so, uh, you know, it's it's lack of understanding sometimes that can be problematic. Uh, an agency in my area of operations uh, did that. They zeroed all their rifles at seven yards <laughs> and uh, had one where he came to the sheriff's office that I was formerly with, and I'm running him through the rifle call, and he shot decent groups, but they weren't anywhere near where they needed to be. And so when I got to asking him, questions well my rifle that i had over there this is where we had to hold to do that says why he says that's where they told us to hold or why well they zeroed all the rifles at seven yards because of this across the room and so we could just put okay now i understand where we're coming from we're going to go back and shoot the call course again and i want you to actually you know inside of 25 yards aim two and a half inches high Outside of 25 yards, shoot where the dot is. And let's try that. And like a score jumped, you know, exponentially. Of course, score doesn't mean a whole, bunch, a whole lot. When, you know, it's a cop call course. The course is easy. <laughs> uh, 
but it's just it just that's what their agency had decided to do. And I'm not going to argue with the agency over it, but have you taught your personnel how to properly use the equipment or have you given them this false crutch that this skill doesn't translate to anything else? And that just is always just kind of kind of bothered me. Shannon, I haven't we gotten you there. We're going to come to you with some questions at some point. It's all good. <laughs> all right, so... When would a citizen be involved in this irregular warfare? Private citizen, not cop, not soldier. Why is this class applicable? Brian, since you came up with the irregular warfare title, we'll go to you first on this. Well, uh, you know, it, it, there's there's a lot of historical incidences now statistically low for most of us. But as we saw riots moving through the city, uh, I was always amazed at the Korean shopkeepers and their uh, their choice to defend it. Uh, mm -hmm. I've when I worked with the sheriff's office, of course, we had uh, a couple of downtown incidences uh, during Freaknik, which were pretty, pretty devastating to a lot of people. Uh, so we've watched this on the news and I thought that would be it. Uh, I realized that uh, if anything happened at my grandkids school, it, it, there's probably nothing that would keep me out of there uh, if if it had become a political hot hot potato and they're going to sit outside of it as we watched at some other schools. I think uh, defending your home and your property, uh, you know, especially if you're, you know, like up here now we have the national forest and some of the officers were telling me that, uh, that they have cartel guys up there, you know? And so this changes it. And I'm, I'm in a very remote area by myself uh, with just my wife and I, and we're both trained shooters. So these sort of things occur to me. And I also wanted the other side of this. I want people to know that this isn't easy, that it requires real skill and training to complementary run something like this. And I want them to know what their limitations are as much as they are, because a lot of times, especially those that are attracted to gear, want to solve every problem with purchases. And as trainers, we always caution against that. But I thought it was a really interesting to, thing to look at it for with our experienced skill sets of what is possible and probable and how could we use this in, in our own scenario. And, and Lord forbid, I, I never want any of this to happen. You know, it's not it's not something that I relish, but I think you have to think about it. And America bought a tremendous amount of rifles, you know, and they're sitting in places and we, we probably know that they're not well zeroed. Uh, that they haven't, they they don't know how the ammunition works in them. They're not really sure how to use them in that that level. So it was the idea of not only when could we use this, but what are the complications, what are the limitations, and how can we help you make a really good decision on you know if this is something you could do, and if it's worth doing it, and if it's worth the risk and the consequences that go along with it. Maybe it's just better to flee the situation. Maybe you have no choice. You know, uh, and and you can make really good decisions because bravado can get us all killed just as much as a lack of knowledge can. And I want everybody to feel very confident to use this gear while they're being watched by uh, two professional teachers that can help them shake it down. Because we saw a lot of changes in gear over the, the couple of days as they work through it. And, you know, a lot of people brought a lot of stuff that was simply discarded after a little while, or they changed their holster setup. And, you know, this is, this is how we work through it. And uh, I thought it was a good idea uh, to, to have this complimentary idea and explore the possibilities. You know, I, I believe, uh, Tom Given said it in class that, you know, we carry a pistol because we can. And if you had to defend your house, you'd use a shotgun. But if you call 911 and nobody answers, you probably should go get your rifle, you know. And that's that's the and it's there's been several times we know the Atlanta Police Department after the Wendy's incident didn't answer calls for a week, you know, and it, that's incredibly scary. And if, if your response time, uh, you know, here in Lumpkin County, it's 45 minutes from one end of the county to the other. And uh, just yesterday, we had a medical emergency on the range. It had nothing to do with shooting. Older gentleman fell down. Uh, he fractured his shoulder. And we had to call 911. It was about 20 minutes for them to get out. That's not a priority call. But these are the type of things that I want people to really think about it. And I'm telling you, when you're by yourself, uh, uh, Claude's book really 
highlighted this, the real life shootings, the LAPD, of what happens when you're out of uniform and you're by yourself and you have to manage really difficult events and situations. And, you know, even for me yesterday, between securing the range, making the phone call, making him comfortable, uh, I, I called my wife. I was like, you got to come over. I need your help. And directing the ambulance to where they could get to him. It was it, it's a lot to handle. And the more training we can get, the more prepared we are, the better decisions we can make. Yeah, it doesn't go the way people think it's, think it's going to mm. go. <laughs> Look at both of us know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, even working in an urban environment, you know, when I worked in the, more so in Athens, which is a larger city, and many a times I stood there standing over people in medical emergencies. Hold on, the ambulance is on the way. Yeah, start whistling the Jeopardy tune. Uh, hold on now, the ambulance is on the way. And then going out into the country, you know, I went out with, with the, the neighboring county's sheriff's office. You know, it's somebody running lights and sirens are still 15 minutes away from you. Now, thankfully, there was actually a network of medical first responders that would get there and save your life. Actually had better response times than the ambulances did in the city. And that was not a slam on the EMT services, just a numbers thing. Uh, which you know, I stress, people have this idea that they call 911 and whatever service they need is going to materially you know, arrive. Well, think about it. Reach out to your county emergency services or your city, wherever you live, and ask them how many ambulance crews are working at any given time. And then I want you to think about what if, because most of the times it's actually going to be two, maybe three, uh, unless you're in a big urban environment. So say you're in a typical county in the United States, you might have two or three ambulances working for the entire county at any given time. Okay, one of one of those has just transported a cardiac patient to the hospital in the nearest by big city. One is at a car wreck and at least one to respond from wherever, or they have to pull from the neighboring county. Folks, this stuff can take a long, long, long time. And, you know, this whole thing of what, you know, firefighters, EMTs, and cops for the first responders is not really accurate. We're the second responders. The first responders should be the people that are their own scene doing it. Yeah. Uh, Shane, anything you'd like to add with what Brian was talking about? Uh, just kind of two things, uh, you know, Brian articulated that wonderfully, which he always does. Um, but, you know, just kind of an incident where I think, you know, where this class, you know, kind of fits in is uh, my my wife's brother, my brother-in-law lives up in Buffalo, just uh, a couple blocks from the uh, active shooter that happened a while back. And, you know, I think we've all seen the video on that. Uh, you know, he went in with a rifle, you know, that would be a be a instance where, you know, if say you did have a truck gun, uh, you know, I wouldn't, unless I absolutely had to go up against that rifle with a pistol and, you know, being able to employ that rifle and, you know, know my capabilities and its capabilities to, to take care of that problem is, is important. Um, you know, and then, because I know for myself, you know, we all fall on this different spectrum of intervention and, and, you know, whether we're going to intervene or not, I know I'm a pretty high intervener, uh, just from past experiences and, you know, being able to employ a rifle to go and, you know, take care of that, that problem set there, I think is a important skill set to have knowing your limitations. And then the, the second thing, you know, kind of going back to what you were saying, as far as response times, it's one of the things, you know, we put out in the beginning of class when we do our mindset and spectrum awareness lecture is, you know, uh, knowing what the response times are, because when you do dial 911, whether it's for, you know, law enforcement, fire, EMS, they just don't materialize. And, uh, you said it perfectly is, you know, you're the first responder and it could be a lengthy period of time. I mean, we live pretty rural here, um, but, you know, pre-COVID in downtown Nashville, when you called 911, regardless of which service, it was a 17 minute response time, you know, which is forever. Yeah. You mentioned something there, you know, you're a pretty high responder. Mm -hmm. And that's, People can sit there and they can say, you know, I'm going to throw out scenario. How are you going to respond? Well, I would, I would, I would 
take my advantage of the opportunity to escape and leave is your intellectual answer. Sometimes people just don't have that capability when it actually starts happening in front of them. Some people will say, oh, I would go save the day. And then when it starts happening, no, I'm going over here. Yeah. And, you know, you find out some of those things only when you're faced with them. And I'm going to say this next thing, not to pat myself on, on the back. I promise you guys, I will not perform a third open water river rescue. And I have to say a third because I've done it twice. And after I did it the first time, I said I was never going to do it again until the next time. Now, the second time, my life was not in danger. There's nothing really dramatic on that. The first time was stupid. And there's no other way to describe it. And if I had to sit there and if you'd ask me beforehand, hey, if that person was out there in the middle of a flood, would you go out there in that water and try to rescue them? I'd say, no, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> I did. <laughs> and it wasn't smart. And the whole time I was doing it, it's like, this is not a good idea. This is not a good idea. You know, and everything. And uh, one of our other guys was there with me, hanging on to the road, rescuing this girl. And when we finally pulled ourselves out of the water and back up onto, not the bank, because we were on an island in the middle of this flood, flood water. Uh, we, we get up there and he looked around me. He's got like a real deep voice. He goes, if our mothers had seen that, we'd be in really bad trouble right now. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we would be. Yeah, we would be. And it's we can say how we're going to respond to certain situations, and it's good to have kind of mentally game that. But it may actually all change uh, when it starts happening. Shannon, I'm going to rope you in here for a second. Why did you sign um, up for I this? I better listen. Why did you sign up for this class? Well, I obviously I've trained a lot with Brian and, um, you know, I love training with Brian. Um, and I had been wanting to take a class with Shane. So when the two of them offered this class together, it was a no brainer, especially, you know, being it was up at Georgia Mountain Shooters. So only takes me an hour to drive there. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was a no brainer, wanted to do it. I've done some two gun shooting, um, done oh, a lot of skill builders with the rifle early on, um, done Appleseed, Project Appleseed with rifle. Um, and so I, I enjoy shooting the rifle, but I'm definitely more of a pistol shooter. Uh, but I also wanted to see if I were just to wear my everyday carry, you know, my inside the waistband appendix, you know, Glock 19, um, just wear what I normally am wearing and see, see how things go. And, um, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't run around with plate carriers on and <laughs> too many tactical stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> I'm just oh, yeah. me, just just a mom here defending her garden. So, yeah, it was fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, I love when I teach. Uh, I have a, a close range carbine class that I teach, and it's all about using AR style rifles, you know, that kind of stuff. But you're using it in the distances that are in or around your home. It's a very limited contents class. And I intentionally show up to teach that class wearing blue jeans instead of any kind of tactical looking pant or anything whatsoever. And I carry my spare magazine, if I even have one on my person, in my back pocket. Just to kind of put it in the more realism. And it's funny the people that show up wearing plate carriers or stuff like that. It's like, do you wear that around your home? <laughs> yeah. And it's just it's always amazes me the, the, the constructs that people get in their head as to what they're going to do with stuff and how they're going to play it. So Shannon, how did you fare with your everyday gear? Um, great. Um, at first I was thinking, well, shooting rifle prone, having an appendix holster on might be an issue, but um, it wasn't at all. Uh, it was actually very comfortable. Um, I was very mobile. Um, didn't really get in the way of the rifle. Um, I didn't really have any major entanglements with a sling or anything like that. So um, I was 
I was real pleased how everything worked together. Um, I don't know what these guys thought. But <laughs> I was I was happy with how everything worked. Okay, what rifle did you run? Um, it was a custom built AR-15. Okay. Uh, Brian, what did most people show up running? <laughs> it was all over the place. Uh, it, thankfully, there weren't too many short short barreled ARs. Uh, so Shane and I didn't suffer any more TBIs. Uh, <laughs> so weren't too many loudners on the end of them, but there were a couple of them. But we saw a pretty large group. I got to say this, though. The most amazing thing is the rifles worked. Uh, we only had one guy that had a little bit of problem uh, towards the last day, but overall the rifles ran well and the equipment was fairly well sorted. Now, uh, this is our first class, so a lot of it was our alumni and they've trained with yeah. both of us. So that's probably part of the sorting process. But, um, you know, the the red dot on the rifle was uh, very popular, uh, but we did have it all over the place. We had low power variable optics, too, and uh, we had a couple iron sight shooters that were there and uh, people exploring the idea of a magnifier with it. And uh, I, I was I was particularly shocked that the rifles uh, shot as well as they did. Uh, of course, Shane had the first block on Saturday morning of zeroing and trying to get everybody situated. So he did a magnificent job of of making that painless uh, for everybody and getting them situated now pistols um you know we're seeing a wide variety of pistols there were a lot of uh optic pistols but a lot of people were shooting iron sights still um and then we saw the usual gamut of sig uh, hk because i'm of course you know hk guy so they'll show up a lot in my class uh and then we we didn't see a lot of uh problems with the pistols either they ran really really well but it was usual glock sig hk not too much customized not a 1911 set in there um and it was interesting because a lot of people chose to run appendix two with the rifle which is a, an interesting setup because you know the rifle clunks on it mm -hmm. and it was a unique draw stroke to teach the concealed draw stroke while the rifle's pinning the shirt all right, for the HK marketing people that may just be listening <laughs> to this and don't watch the YouTube feed, Brian is wearing an HK shirt. He did point to the logo when he said HK. <laughs> so make sure make sure whoever the guy is in the county checks both of those boxes. Uh, Thank you, Lee. <laughs> uh, any issues with like people that were running an optic on their pistol, like when they went prone and they get up or they're getting up and they're like being dirt in their optic if they were running open emitter, anything like that? Not that I saw with anybody on there uh, with it. Uh, nothing really with the optics. We didn't even have any any battery issues. You know, we had the usual. That's odd. Yeah, we we had the usual brightness issues where I saw a yeah. mad scramble. You know, for them to set it up. I'll tell you, the hardest part was getting those zero. Uh, yeah. It was you know to shoot a ten yard zero with an optic pistol. For some of those people, they're really more rifle prone, and that was very difficult. So it, it was, uh, you know, I I I am spoiled because I get to work with a lot of great shooters, and I and my wife says I no longer have real expectations of what people can do. <laughs> so that may all be true, but it was tough when we got to ten yards and people are shooting, you know, trying to shoot a zero. Uh, I had to teach a fundamentals block to get them back on track to shoot that well. Um, but overall, the holsters. You know, we didn't, I don't remember a subpar holster. Do you, uh, no. they were mm -hmm. well set up. So that's this is too. our first run. <laughs> that's odd too. And that may also be an artifact of their role alumni. Yeah. yeah the, uh, Shane, anything on the gear and the zero? No, I mean, one of the things, you know, Brian and I talked about was, you know, in the first morning, in addition to, to the zeroing and getting them, you know, to the apply the fundamentals of marksmanship, through that process was, uh, you know, we did a brief mindset and spectrum of awareness lecture just to kind of tie it all together. Cause I think, you know, we both think that that's important, but then we spent a little bit of time on equipment and I brought, you know, pretty much a gypsy camp of a little bit of everything, uh, to let people know that, Hey, there, there's several options out there, you know, from what are the accoutrements we can hang on, you know, our rifles and pistols to, you know, the supporting gear that goes along with it. So, you know, we had all, you know, different types of slings and body armor and just uh, magazine holders and and chest racks. And I even brought my old uh, H harness from, you know, when I was in the 82nd patrol and just to show that there's there's other options out there. 
Um, but as far as equipment wise, uh, you know, with the exception of people figuring it out because they weren't used to uh, running with the rifle and the pistol together, um, I didn't really see any any equipment issues at all, uh, especially with the with the guns. Uh, they miraculously all all ran, and we didn't didn't have to deal with those problems. Okay, you know, Brian mentioned it, it just made me think of it. So prevalent in the AR world is that people that what, build their own ARs, like you didn't build that, you just bought parts and put them all together. Now, if you build it, you're actually out there with the lathe turning stuff and, and, and manufacturing the parts. You're just a symbol. Uh, jokingly, you hear people call them franking guns. And it's not uncommon to see those fail miserably once they get put under some kind of stress. So it's interesting to hear. Uh, that you didn't have any of that uh, taking place. Uh, Brian, one thing you touched on that it is interesting, people that are running the concealed pistol, especially in the appendix, and then they've dropped their rifle and they're going to go to the pistol, now they got this whole process of stuff ain't where it usually is when they go to draw the pistol. What did you see with that process? I, I made sure that at the beginning um... – you know, I, 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 I find it to be a very interesting problem uh, because it's something unique. And uh, what I got them to do with the rifle is to move it off to their their support side more so that they could do it. Mm -hmm. But then the clearing of the shirt had to be done primarily with the, the primary hand. There was no other way to do it. So it becomes that you better have good ability, you know, uh, with different draw sets, which is something I've preach forever you know hands up hands down hands at your side draw with one hand and your wonderful class what is it called critical uh trauma Masoch skills. Masochist pistol. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you should be able to draw with it and and what they i saw a lot of them do is they secure the rifle and then you know primary hand only and then be able to draw the pistol but there was a real learning curve on that there was a quite a bit of uh you could see people adjusting their slings because uh, some of them had their slings set up really tight to their body. So it was hard for them to get the position. Some of them had to run all the way out. Some of them had it at the back. So there was a lot of fiddling with that. And then uh, we're really lucky at Georgia mountain because on the, on the 50 yard range, there's two bays off to the side and then there's the long distance. So we can just move somebody over the side and help them. And we had uh, three assistants, uh, that work with me, Harriet was there and Mike and Tamara. So they could grab anybody. And that's probably why nothing went wrong because they were there, you know, and yeah. it, it was, it was really interesting with the concealed draw though, but nobody struggled too much. They got pretty used to it pretty quick and it seemed to work really well. Um, movements, a little bit of a problem, you know, that rifle bouncing up and down, but Sheen was really good at staying on them to, to keep control of the rifle at all times. And, uh, you know, I, I personally find rifle classes much harder to manage safety wise than pistol classes, you know, and nobody's used to living with a rifle. They may shoot it, but they're not used to moving or living with a rifle. And that was a real different problem. And I think Shane can talk to that a little bit, but he did a really good job on getting them more accustomed to doing that. Sure. Uh, we'll, we'll come to that, uh, next Shane, I teach a class. That the title of it's called was formerly called Critical Pistol Skills. I now call it Pistol Craft Four. And you will have done one, two, and three with me before you come to Pistol Craft Four, uh, just because of some some shenanigans that that, that mm -hmm. took place in a particular class. And it's all about, I call it a one percent class. You don't come to this unless you've got everything else mastered. And you just you're a training junkie and you gotta learn how to do this thing. And it's learning how everything could possibly go wrong with your pistol and how you got to fix it. So you're doing support hand only, not only draws, but malfunction clearances and stuff like that. And Brian will send me a message. <sighs> I'm coming to this class because I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and you make me do this stuff. And then I get a message from Shelly. It's like for the last five mornings, he's been in her dry practice and this stuff and cussing your name. as <laughs> it's. Uh, so it's it's fun but it's it's tedious and it's hard you know where it served me well was rogers yeah that's where it served me well yeah so thank you <laughs> yeah uh learning how to do that when you're hiding behind uh you know old steel mailbox or mm -hmm. trying to get up under a curb somewhere and learning how to do that stuff for your guns not the place to learn how to do that you didn't know how to do that beforehand uh, Shane, tell us about the whole concept of living with a rifle that Brian just mentioned. 
Well, so, you know, obviously with my, you know, former job and that, that was, you know, our, our primary, you know, weapon, we had, had pistols and we spent a lot of time with them too, but, you know, primarily everything we did with the rifle and, you know, from that background and then in the class, uh, you know, it's a foreign concept to a lot of people. And one of the things that, you know, I, I told the class and I tell every class is, you know, anybody can shoot a rifle. It's, it's easy The shooting, you know, whatever system it is, is easy, but to be a rifleman, woman, rifle person, whatever moniker is, is politically correct, um, you know, takes a lot of work. And, you know, there's some things that you have to learn, equipment being one of them. And the biggest thing that I think I see is uh, sling usage. You know, people put slings on their gun, whatever the latest and greatest is. And, and I've gone through every, you know, stage that there's been. And but that's all they do is they put the sling on the gun and then when they're not shooting, the gun hangs around their neck like it's a necklace. And there's, you know, so much more that we can do with that sling. And so that was, you know, something that we tried to implement in the class was, uh, you know, if we have a good, you know, two point adjustable sling and we learn how to integrate it in with lengthening and shortening it up, pad stability in the different positional shoots we did, uh, you know, your ability to hit or get the round to go where you want it to goes up exponentially. And so it's really, you know, putting that work in and being comfortable with, you know, that system, your pistol, how they work together, and then that associated equipment to be able to get the hit that you need and have confidence in your abilities. Are you talking about using the sling for stabilization? Yes. So, you know, big thing we did, you know, uh, when we got onto the 300 range was, you know, start teaching people positional shooting, uh, you know, different things like speed knee or traditional NRA style knee, seated, prone, standing offhand, and utilizing that sling and, and being able to, as you're getting into position, tighten it down. And as you get lower to the ground, get that more solid, stable, and durable position, but utilizing that sling to add stability, to slow down that sighting system, to get it to settle where you need it. And then having the ability, once you have fired the shots, because uh, we know that, you know, gunfights are dynamic endeavors. Uh, when we get into position, we want to minimize the sacrifice of mobility. And we talked, you know, quite a bit about that with the different positions and how to modify them. So we're trying to gain as much stability as possible with not sacrificing too much mobility. And then when the shots are done, being able to loosen up that sling, get that rifle in a position, a strength where you can control it and have muzzle awareness, trigger finger awareness, and safety awareness, and then be able to move to another more advantageous position. All right, so Shannon, what did you learn about living with the rifle? Huh. Um, <laughs> I guess you could say I'm more of a minimalist. <laughs> I much prefer just having my pistol on me. Um, it's like, oh, get this clunky thing out of my way. Mm -hmm. Um no, but it it um I really liked having the opportunity to realize, okay, this is what I need to do. As Brian was saying about how to get the rifle out of my way when I was drawing my pistol. Um, so that was huge. Um, that was, that was very, very helpful. Um, but yeah, I, I still prefer shooting the pistol. Um, unless we're going long distance, I guess you could say if it, if something is, you know, under 25 yards, I'll grab my pistol. If it's over that, the rifle would be great. <laughs> All right. Well, I know you are a veteran of pistol classes. What was it like being on a line full of people with rifles and having to move in and out amongst them? And you've got all these people got these guys because now they're not just putting it in a holster. Yeah. They got to control that muzzle. Yeah. Um, I would say, and this is probably because most of them uh, have trained with Brian and Shane. They were very, very safety conscious. Um, I, I was very impressed. You look around, everybody's finger was high and up um, off the trigger um at their rifles um you know occasionally you might see somebody 
maybe they kind of swung it a little high, but they immediately saw that and they corrected it. Um, you know, obviously when you have rifles, you see a lot of people accidentally muzzling their feet um, and other people's feet. <laughs> but really, for the most part, I was very, very impressed at how well everyone did with the rifle um, and with the pistol. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a different world, especially when you strap that long gun to you. Uh, one of the things I always make sure I'm cognizant about in the safety brief is, okay, you've got this gun strapped across your chest. Now, when you bend over to pick something up, where is that muzzle going if you don't control that? And that's sometimes it's hard to get across to newer people to the long gun. And so you got to kind of hands on more shepherd them a bit. Did y'all have any issues of that or is it because of this particular student body? Um you know, being more training veterans. I tell you one thing we had to really watch for was fatigue. Uh, they weren't, oh, yeah. they weren't used to going up and down with rifles constantly. And you could see the fatigue to set in. And, you know, like when we, uh, I, I did several busy hand contexts where they had to bend over and pick up something and mm -hmm. to hold that rifle under the armpit and come down and up. It was, it was very good Saturday, but you could see they were really starting to hurt. And then uh, as we see in pistol classes, you know, I'm, I, I'm older myself too, but as, as, as people age, that rifle's a lot mm -hmm. harder to deal with, you know, yeah. and they're not used to all those up drills. And then Shane's got them, you know, uh, going prone and sitting and standing. And then we found there were some real limitations, like neck flexibility was a huge mm -hmm. one, uh, how bad knees were. So it was a great exploration of that, but fatigue really started to play a role with it, you know, and they, we had to stay on the line and be more cognizant with them in that, that moment, because it wasn't, they didn't know what to do, but they were start. you could see they were getting tired yeah. handling all this stuff. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because a AR-15 in its purest form is a quote, lightweight carbine mm. until you carry that thing all day or, and, or you start hanging stuff all over. Uh, Shane, what's the old saying in the military? Ounces make pounds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like Brian said, you know, the fatigue was a big thing. And, you know, they probably got got tired of me saying it. But, you know, uh, when they were done each time, you know, like make sure your fingers outside the trigger well, uh, trigger safe or excuse me, uh, be conscious of your safety and control that rifle with your, you know, dominant hand or your master grip. And, you know, and when we were talking, uh, you started seeing I don't want to say discipline issues, but I think more fatigue issues where people were just letting those rifles hang, you know, just by the slings, like it was a necklace. So, you know, we continued to emphasize, Hey, you know, we need to have, you know, a little bit of self-discipline control of the rifle with the master grip. So we have that muzzle awareness of, you know, around ourselves, but then around everybody else. And, uh, but by and large, it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. Yeah. It's, that's one of the things you just got to be extra special cognizant of in a rifle class is, is all of that. Because, yeah, you mentioned Tom Givens as Tom loves to say, we don't work anymore. We sit in cubicles. And it's a lot different from breakfast to lunch than it is about three or four o'clock. You start seeing some issues really start to creep in. And this was a two day class. So it probably yeah. started coming a lot earlier on second day as well mm. especially yep. with all that physical activity right. so shannon what was your biggest takeaway from the class oh goodness there's a lot of takeaways um oh goodness <laughs> you're putting me on the spot we're watching <laughs> <laughs> You've done this show before. You know how this works. <laughs> All right. Um, biggest takeaway. Uh, I really, um, I really enjoyed shooting my pistol. I that that probably sounds so lame, um, but I just found that you know during that one particular drill that we were doing um, that had the silhouette and, um, you know, like the casino drill um, on steroids. Um, most people I noticed were mainly using their rifle for that. 
as soon as my rifle was out, like I'm going to my pistol, <laughs> even though I might have to do two or three mag changes with it, because I just felt that I handled it. Um, well, because I'm more familiar with it. Um, I was more fluid with it. So I guess then you could say my biggest takeaway is I need more practice, more time on the rifle. That's understandable. I, you know, I got drug kicking and screaming to the AR platform. I, I did not and really do not have warm and fuzzies for it. I, I had to learn it because my job required me uh, to learn it. Uh, you know, given my preferences, if I'm going to have a long gun, I, I want either a lever action 30 30 or a shotgun. And uh, yeah, uh, it took some getting used to. And there is a thing about wanting to go back to your happy place. So, uh, Shane, what was your biggest takeaway from teaching the class? What did you come away with? I think, um, number one, I think probably uh, the level of dedication of the students that were there. I mean, very attentive, uh, you know, were sponges, wanted to learn learn the material. Uh, I saw that, you know, just like, you know, Shannon said, and, and we've kind of identified is, you know, people aren't used to living with the rifle or running the rifle. So, you know, that's where they needed, you know, a lot of work uh, and it takes dedication. Um, some people were, you know, a lot more used to, to the pistol and you could see where that was at, but everybody, you know, took the time and put the work in and the, the instruction that was given, they implemented it. And so I think just the, just the overall dedication of the, of the students in the class, uh, you know, was extremely rewarding for me and, and a big takeaway that, uh, you know, there's definitely a need for training out there, um, but there's people who want to do it. And and it was evident because they were in class. Brian, same question. So as the poster child for kleptonesia, uh, I'm going to remember all of Shane's ideas as my own from now on. So I've stolen yeah. all his material. So uh, that's your only attribution. We're done from here. All right. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 three things really occurred to me. Uh, number one, on the instructor level, the professional level, it's nice to occupy the range with another instructor. Uh, it gives fresh perspective. It reminds you of things and it lets you look in a different way. And I think Shane and I were able to complement each other and, uh, and work in an environment, which is not always the same thing. You know, there's uh, all of us have a certain amount of ego when we teach and we want to do things, but I, I felt like the students were primary in our focus always. And uh, that's the, the thing that we made really important. Uh, as far as watching the students, it's very interesting to watch the striker generation deal with safeties. It's very difficult for them. So it's a wonderful activity for them to learn how to do it. But it was fun to watch them work through it. And since this was such a comprehensive course, I mean, we did everything from, you know, shooting close to shooting far to working cover to doing movement. Uh, it kept them engaged at a very high level and it created that uh, complexity and novelty we need for our students because it's as much as we want to isolate them, we also need to challenge them in new vistas and create more energy and interest. And like Shannon said that, you know, then she said she could feel the difference because I have just the opposite problem. Like when I put the rifle down and I get the pistol out, it feels like a cap gun. You know, it feels very inconsequential in that moment. And uh, I think that's the disparity of training. And then just on my level, it was very interesting to, to watch people, manage the three things that we see constantly gear and then technique and then performance stress uh shane and i both did a shooting test at the end of it and mine was a version of mix six but transitions from the rifle to the pistol and then he did a different distance thing and nobody could have predicted who would have been the top shot from those drills it was very interesting and frankly some of the rifle shooters shot better on the pistol drill because they were more present and vice versa, uh, the gentleman that won, he was surprised that he was top shot, but he stayed present on both drills and and shot exceptionally well and had low expectations for that. He just shot, shot it. So it was interesting to watch that kind of uh, stress come out and watch people really perform to a high level. Expand on staying present. 
that's one of those nuts and bolts things that we got to dig into. Yeah. You know, so the, you know, we talk about the process and the process is, you know, feeling the shooting, what does good shooting feel like? Lanny Basham talked about this and with winning in mind that you have to remember what it feels like to shoot well, to be connected. And that feeling is coordination, doing the minimum amount of effort to get the maximum result. And then being present is vision. Am I perceiving what I think I'm perceiving? Because a lot of times um, when people shoot, they think they're going to see something, so they stop watching. So to get them to stay present in the whole process and watch it, the novelty between going from rifle to pistol creates a new visual perception, I think. And it helped them stay more present in their shooting because they knew they were doing something complex. you know. And it's really, as instructors, it's hard to create novelty and complexity that is both, you know, interesting and safe on the range and that's what led to a lot of presence in my my opinion all right um you, know, you mentioned team teaching i probably think it's safe to say that your shane showed up on time and my shane has never showed up on time <laughs> and yes i'm talking about you shane Gosa. <laughs> <laughs> I have to throw that in. I love teaching with Shane, but I had to kidnap him the night before a class and keep him tied up in my trunk to get him there on time. So oh, I, I oh. could not, I could not pass that opportunity to take a dig at Shane, because so, he he's been sending me text messages all day about the uh, last episode we did about cop shows. It's like, <laughs> why was it this one discussed? Why was it that one discussed? So I had to take a dig. Um. What future offerings of this course are available? So we got it. We got it up by us here um, at one of the ranges we use up in just outside of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. It's coming up in September. And I think Brian and I have both agreed we're going to try and make it a twice a year, uh, once in Georgia and, and once up here by us, either in Tennessee or just across the border in Kentucky. So, yeah, the next one's coming up in, in September. Okay, you're in the Fort Campbell area, right? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay, so about two hours from Nashville then? Yeah, we we live uh, in the home range that we use is about, about an hour west of Nashville. Uh, the one that we're going to use for the class in September is just north across the border. Um, so still only about an hour from Nashville, uh, just outside of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Uh, okay. Cedar Ridge Precision is the is the range we're going to use for that one. Okay. All right. I had polled the members of the That Weems Guy Facebook group for questions. And I got one that was sent to me by a private message. And I told you guys before the show uh, what it was because I hate playing gotcha uh, with <laughs> questions. All right. So the, what, what this uh, regular listener or viewer of the show wanted to know was how long could a person expect to actually live if they're having to deploy the skills that are in this class and i know that's kind of how long it's a piece of string but shane what do you got uh depends on how much they practice <laughs> no really i mean there's a lot of ambiguity to that question as yeah. you know yeah. um situation drives what we do uh brian said it earlier uh you know if we can disengage or or not be in that fight you know that that's ideal uh because they're they're mean nasty things and and you know, we might still come out on top, but uh, we could be heard or, you know, we could, mm -hmm. you know, eventually expire because of, of what happened, that particular incident. Right. But but the situation is really going to be dependent. And then, you know, where are you? What are you, uh, you know, are you off somewhere and, and something catastrophic happens and you have to make your way home? Or, you know, are you in outside of a mall and there's an active shooter and you decide to respond? Um Again, you know, skill at arms, uh, being present, being able to problem solve, because, you know, one of the biggest things that I say all the time is, you know, a gunfight, it, it's just a problem. You know, there's there's deadly consequences with it, but it's still just a problem for us to solve. You know, how how well versed are we, uh, you know, in our training and our ability to critically think and problem solve and, and you know, come out on top. Uh, so for me, you know, again, it's really situational dependent. And what your mission, and to use a military term, is, uh, and that will depend, you know, on on you know the amount of time. Hopefully, we all get to go home to the people that we care about, regardless of the situation. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the far away from home. In my daily world, I can avoid most hot spot that will pop up. 
in my in my life, area that I live. But thinking back to 2016 election, I found myself in Des Moines, Iowa. And I'm watching the election results. And I'm thinking, you know what? I got to drive back to the Athens, Georgia area. The most direct route is you know, through St. Louis, come around, come down, come down through Nashville and all that kind of stuff. Or I can take this winding indirect route where I miss most major cities but Memphis. Well, I know people in Memphis. I've got help there. And I got some family along the way. And so I'm planning that whole route back as what if, you know, on the morning you're going to start back home, you turn on the news as you're getting dressed and like all these cities have broken out major riots. How are you going to get home? And so that went into a lot of planning. So that's, you know, kind of the situation of what I think you're describing as the class kind of came into play. And it was, how do I avoid these fights and avoid these problems? Really? Brian? What, what's, what's your thoughts on that question? Well, I, I would invert the question. Uh, with how many incidents have we've seen where somebody takes decisive action and has made all the difference in the world? You know, we need that one person sometimes mm-hmm. to take action. Uh, yes, it's at, at the risk of your own life. I would say that it you can manage it best by making good decisions in advance, what you're willing to fight for and what you're not. Uh, what you're capable of, and especially what you're not capable of, what you could handle, what the equipment is. You know, for me, I travel. I'm on the road all the time, and I go to places that are particularly unfriendly uh, that, you know, like California, where I don't carry a, a pistol. But I never feel unarmed. I, I never feel that I'm inadequate to the task. And my hope was with this class that people would find what their adequacy was to the task and what they could do and what they could be capable of. You know, good decisions are always made in advance and it allows you to to work with this. And I'd say the hardest thing about being by yourself is you're going to have to modulate the speed of the events. Sometimes you're going to have to move very fast. Sometimes you're going to have to move very slow. And, you know, it's like young officers pulling up on a scene. Uh, they tend to jump out of the car and get busy, which is always the wrong thing. The assessment phase Let's look at the problem. Let's look at the concept. Let's see what we've got available to us. And that's why I was especially excited to do this with Shane, because that's what his background is. Mm -hmm. You know, he has to go teach other people how to do these things in the world. uh, And oftentimes with suboptimal equipment and suboptimal places, Hell, one of his pieces of equipment had desert dirt falling out of it still. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, and I, and I I understand the person, how long can we last? Well, it's going to be relative to the quality of the decisions you make. It always will be. And uh, there are things that you can do to extend it. And there are things that I think are worth giving your life for also. Okay. Uh, I do have to point out that you're being unarmed. It's not like other people being unarmed. No. <laughs> <laughs> there are differences, Brian. Maybe we need to talk about those later. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you want me to break people. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shannon, do you feel like you increased your capabilities in this class? Oh, definitely. I mean, anytime that um, I'm taking a training class or I'm practicing, um, you know, that myelination is occurring. And um, so, yeah, I, I definitely feel, I guess you could say a little more confident. Um but um, yeah, like Shane was saying and Brian was saying, you can try to plan these things and have it all figured out in your head, but you never know how it's gonna go. Uh, so the best thing to do is just continue training. Um, it's, it's like going to the gym, you know, you can't just get one workout and it, <laughs> expect to be all buff. Ain't going to happen. It's a continual process. So um, I'll just continue training and practicing and being aware, (laughs) which uh, actually that that comes to mind. I was at the grocery store today and I can't tell you how many people were walking through the parking lot like this. Drives me crazy um 
you know, you, how's that saying go? You can't win the fight you don't see. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the biggest thing, you know, it, it's great to train, great to practice, but um, awareness, you know, knowing your surroundings is the number one. You know, get your head away from your phone. Uh, would it be fair to say that we're not talking, that th this class is not advocating, say, like, Kyle Rittinghouse sitting at home watching these things on the news and he went and put himself in those situations. We're talking about you found yourself in this situation. This is how to get yourself out. Is that fair to say? Shane? Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, it's one of those things and we can put ourselves in a bad situation because we, you know, we think we're righteous and we're most likely not. Uh, so no, this is if violence comes to you and it's unavoidable, you have the ability to, you know, protect yourself, protect your family members. Um, but if we can avoid it, that's exactly what we want to do, because uh, that's the best fight that we can be in is not in one at all. Right. You know, I I, I, I went to uh, Boondocks to teach recently and uh, Andy Anderson, who's our SWAT doc down there, sent me a video of a rifle shootout on the very street my hotel was. So, uh, <laughs> so when I went to Jackson, Mississippi, I rolled a little bit heavier than I usually do because I was traveling in a car and I thought, I thought twice about it. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't, I didn't have a choice, but to go there, but you know, sometimes now the, the, the thought is I should be a bit better equipped and I'll tell you what, I can go the rest of my life without getting in another fight of any sort, any capability. And, uh, but there are places in the world, as as Lee has done on his magical murder tour, apparently trying to get home, <laughs> that are particularly dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny. I was in Memphis once, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, this isn't really, this isn't really worse than Atlanta. I don't know why everybody makes it out to be so bad. And then the sun went down. I'm like, oh my gosh, where am I? <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's time to go. And, uh, you know, when you're sitting in your hotel room at the desk next to the window studying and the gunfight breaks out on the street below you and like you move the chairs and everything to this back into the center of the room away from the windows, like, you know, maybe this is not the best place for me to be. Yeah, You can count on Lee for two things in life for sure. All right. You could call him anywhere in the country and say, where should I eat? And which hotel should I stay at? Because he'll tell you, don't go here, don't go there. He knows all of this information. <laughs> uh, some of it learned through bad, bad experiences. Uh, yeah, I, I no longer rely on the pictures from the hotel webpage. We Google Earth those things. <laughs> and we look all around. And we read, try to find crime reports from the areas and, and the like uh, before we choose the state places now. Uh, from from one trip in which oh the hotel looks at like it's fine, and the hotel was everything around it was, <laughs> was, was not. Uh, um, Shane, what do you have coming up through uh, your business, and how can people get in touch with you? Uh, so we've got some classes at our home range. Actually, we're getting into our rifle carbine series, and then um, our next traveling class uh, is the first weekend in May. We'll be down in Texas with Steve Moses and the PTG guys. Uh, you can get a hold of us at, through the website, www.personalsurvivalsolutions.com. And then we're also uh, on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn uh, at Personal Survival Solutions. Right. Uh, I head to Missouri next, uh, an unusual during the week class. And then I go to Utah after that. And uh, I have, I think I have 20 or 30 more classes on the road, maybe more than that the rest of the year. And uh, we'll be at a girl in the gun conference teaching. And uh, it's it's a big adventure right now. So uh, teaching at the range, out on the range, uh, coming to a class near you. And uh, pretty excited to do that. If you need to uh, find the schedule, it's at thecompletecombatant.com. That's thecompletecombatant.com. <laughs> and y'all have gotten a place in Delonica back open, right? Yes. Yeah, we're, we're going good. We just... Uh, all of you that have trained with me, you're going to relish this moment because we just got crusher dust put across the whole range. It's four inches thick. You will not stand on those acupuncture gravel rocks that we had anymore. Uh, I can't take it. 
<laughs> so uh, we finally got that sorted. And uh, we teach one class a month there, and the other three are on the road. Okay. Shannon? Um, yeah, I'm um, running a new chapter, co-leader um, with Stacy Dawson uh, for Armed Women of America, um, Gainesville, Georgia. And we're running that the third Wednesday evening of the month. Uh, we also have a ladies defensive pistol group that Steve Havey runs. That's the second Wednesday of the month over at Johns Creek indoor gun range. Um, you can reach me um, on Facebook, Shannon's Garden and Gun Gallery, um, or just under my name, you can look for me there. Um, I'm running a couple of private classes um, for some folks uh, on concealed carry and another ladies class. And then I'll probably be running another red dot class. Um, that was actually very successful. So, and I just continue to teach a lot of private classes or private one-on-ones. Okay. Are you able to do private stuff there at Cherokee? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually okay. that's where I've been running the classes. Okay. I've got a referral that I probably need to make to you. Uh, I'll do okay. an intro email introduction here coming up pretty quick. Okay. Sounds good. Um, I am a matter of weeks away from finishing this graduate program. Darn you, David Cagle. Um, <laughs> she released this final class as a series of eight modules. And then we have two projects in addition to that. And this weekend, module two was due. And I've actually done module two. And I submitted module three earlier today. And I'm going to try to module, lock out module four uh, over the rest of the weekend so I can get done with this thing. And actually go back because I had an opportunity to come up and I'm like, I haven't generated any business revenue since September, so I can't do that. And uh, so I've got to get back to doing some stuff. I've got a range reserve dip in the Dalton, Georgia area uh, for September 21st, but we haven't decided what class we're going to do yet. But uh, keep watching the webpage because eventually I will start announcing some stuff once I decide to get back into it. But it's going to all be fairly close to home because, you know, I started a new job recently and I don't have vacation time and leave and I'm not going to use it all to work anymore. Good for that's you. A, that's what <laughs> I'm done with. Uh, just taking every day I have of leave to go work a third job. No, uh, we, we decided we're going to stop doing that kind of nonsense. But uh, Shane, any final thoughts or anything that I should have asked you about that I didn't? Uh, just final thought, you know, I want to give a shout out to, Shelly and my wife Callie because they did a lot of behind the scenes stuff here and you know Brian mentioned the AIs that were there but you know Callie and Shelly you know put this whole thing together and they're I can speak for myself and I think for Brian too is those two uh, really run the companies and allow us to do you know what we do and so I just wanted to, to give them a big thanks and and some credit. And you see guys that's how you stay married right there. <laughs> Brad. smart man <laughs> saving <laughs> both of us <laughs> yes. well you, you know it was really great to teach something different occasionally uh i, I love i love teaching and i love watching people learn and this was a, a great opportunity and i really appreciate you lee for having us on Sure. And allowing us to get this message out and, and using your podcast to do so. And I would say those of you that don't know Shannon, you should train with her. She's humble, but she's an extraordinarily good shooter and an even better teacher. And the same thing with Lee. Uh, you need to get in there and, and train with these folks if Lee announces it on the schedule. Of course, there's that thing <laughs> if he's working. But uh, very grateful uh, to all of you. Uh, grateful to my wife for, for doing all the hard stuff and the heavy lifting and uh, to Cali also, and grateful for uh, sharing the stage with Shane and uh, incredibly grateful to the alumni that show up over and over and over again uh, to listen to us pontificate about things Marshall. Shannon? Oh, it's back to me. I thought I already spoke. Oh, just, <laughs> is there any final thoughts or anything that I should have asked thoughts? about that I did? Or anything I should have asked about that I didn't? I can't really think of anything, but um, I just, I wish I had a Callie and a Shelly. Um. 
You can't have mine. <laughs> mine either. <laughs> Yeah. But, shame, um, shame one year for Christmas I gave Shelly a gift bag full of empty gift bags because I was the I remember that. Shelly. and she was excited <laughs> I'm sorry, I, Shannon, I, didn't that. I didn't mean to interrupt Shannon what were you saying? no that's that's quite all right so, um, uh, thank you for um, for having me on and sure. um, yeah I I can't say enough good things about Brian and Shane uh, they both are incredible instructors, uh, both very patient, um, very organized, very clear um, at instructing. Um, and for anybody that's thinking, because I know some people have had poor experiences um, training under folks that were military and kind of got scared off. Um, you won't have that here. Um, it's they're both extremely friendly, um, very welcoming, and they're they're not going <laughs> to drill you and and cuss at you or do anything like that. Where I know some, especially some women, have had some bad experiences, and you won't have that with either of these gentlemen. So, strongly encourage you to train with them. Thank you. See, that was worth coming back to you for right there. Yeah. There you go. That was worth having, that was worth having you on uh, tonight. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, folks, here's the time where Lee tries to hold it together because today is March 29th. And uh, 79 years ago today, um, my great uncle Howard was killed in action outside of Dessenheim, Germany. Um, I've read two firsthand accounts of how it happened and I know of some of his other exploits and uh, from his medal citations 19 year old mill worker who initially wanted to be a conscientious subjector and then apparently decided that wasn't the path for him to take and trying to save his buddies uh, he was killed by a German 20 millimeter flak shell and um it's left a hole in the family that's never been filled. Of course, it was before I was born. Um, but the last conversation that I had with my Uncle Dewey, who was also a World War II veteran, as was my grandfather, uh, was him telling me every story he could think of about Howard and then telling me, you have to keep his memory alive. Because if we let it go, we're the only people that can do this. And if we, if once his memory's gone, he's gone. So, uh, folks... Please help me remember Uncle Howard. And uh, we know that your number one asset is your time. So thank you for choosing to spend some of it with us.